There is no doubt that after the end of the Cold War, the US has become a superpower or an empire. It's a fancy word for an empire, right? The US has over 800 military bases in over 70 countries around the world, including in my country, Syria, which they have illegal military bases. But the question here is, is the military power alone enough for the US or any other country to become a superpower and stay in a position of a superpower? In my opinion, there should be at least three pillars for any empire or a superpower to sustain its hegemonic power on a global sphere. First is the military, the second is economic, and finally is the cultural. Now, the military, you can use the military in order to exert your hegemony on the world, whether through threats or direct invasions. But also you can use the military in order to improve your, your economy. And that happened in the past centuries, where the imperialists traveled all around the world, whether especially with their armies, and they colonized the world in order to get more financial and economic resources or natural resources, right? So they expanded their economic strength through the military power here. And the examples of that are countless. But the most important thing here is, for this topic of, the, uh, of this video, is the cultural hegemony. Now, if we go back a little bit, we will see that the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Islamic Empire, the Mongols, the Ottoman Empire, name it. They all had this cultural hegemony. So they were culturally superior on other people or population, and they exerted or exported this cultural hegemony on other countries. They exported their civilization, their culture, their language, and ideology. And it doesn't matter if they exported this through military means, or through soft power means. They did it in any way. Now, in order to elaborate on this very important point, which is cultural hegemony or cultural imperialism, I want to quote a chapter from Vrijensky's book, which I am referring to recently because uh, I'm also reading it again, The Grand Chessboard. I want to mention this, one of the parts that he speaks about the cultural hegemony or cultural hegemony in order for us to have a better understanding. Take a look. Although America's international preeminence unavoidably evokes similarities to early imperial systems, the differences are more essential. They go beyond the question of territorial scope. American global power is exercised through a global system of distinctively American design that mirrors the domestic American experience. Central to that domestic experience is the pluralistic character of both the American society and its political system. The earlier empires were built by aristocratic political elites and were, in most cases, ruled by essentially authoritarian or absolutist regimes. The bulk of the populations of the imperial states were either politically indifferent or, in more recent times, infected by imperialist emotions and symbols. The quest for national glory, the white man's burden, la mission civilastris, not to speak of the opportunities of personal profit, all served to mobilize support for imperial adventures and to sustain essentially hierarchical imperial power pyramids. The attitude of the American public toward the external projection of American power has been much more ambivalent. The public supported America's engagement in World War II, largely because of the shock effect of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The engagement of the United States in the Cold War was initially endorsed more reluctantly until the Berlin blockade and the subsequent Korean War. After the Cold War had ended, the emergence of the United States as the single global power did not evoke much public gloating. 
but rather elicited an inclination toward a more limited definition of American responsibilities abroad. Public opinion polls conducted in 1995 and 1996 indicated a general public preference for sharing global power with others rather than for its monopolistic exercise. Because of these domestic factors, the American global system emphasizes the technique of co-optation, as in the case of defeated rivals, Germany, Japan, and lately even Russia, to a much greater extent than the earlier imperial systems did. It likewise relies heavily on the indirect exercise of influence on dependent foreign elites while drawing much benefit from the appeal of its democratic principles and institutions. All of the foregoing are reinforced by the massive but intangible impact of the American domination of the global communication, popular entertainment and mass culture and by the potentially very tangible clout of the America's technological edge and global military reach. Cultural domination has been an underappreciated facet of American global power. Whatever one may think of its aesthetic values, America's mass culture exercises a magnetic appeal, especially on the world's youth. Its attraction may be derived from the hedonistic quality of lifestyle it projects, but its global appeal is undeniable. American television programs and films account for about three-fourths of the global market. American popular music is equally dominant, while American fads, eating habits and even clothing are increasingly imitated worldwide. The language of the internet is English, and an overwhelming population of the global computer chatter also originates from America, influencing the continent of global conversation. Lastly, America has become a mecca for those seeking advanced education, with approximately half a million foreign students flocking to the United States, with many of the ablest never returning home from American universities are to be found in almost every cabinet on every continent. The style of many foreign democratic politicians also increasingly emulates the American. Not only did John F. Kennedy find eager imitators abroad, but even more recent and less glorified American political leaders have become the object of careful study and political imitation. Politicians from cultures as desperate as the Japanese and the British. For example, the Japanese Prime Minister of the mid-1990s, Ryotaro Hashimoto, and the British Prime Minister Tony Blair. And note the Tony imitative of Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, or Bob Dole find it perfectly appropriate to copy Bill Clinton's homey mannerisms populist common touch and public relation techniques. Democratic ideals associated with the American political tradition further reinforce what some perceive as America's cultural imperialism. In the age of the most massive spread of the democratic form of government, the American political experience tends to serve as a standard for emulation. The spreading emphasis worldwide on the centrality of a written constitution and on the supremacy of law over political expediency, no matter how short change in practice, has drawn upon the strength of American constitutionalism. In recent times, the adoption by the former communist countries of civilian supremacy over the military, especially as a precondition for NATO membership has also been heavily influenced by the U.S. system of civil-military relations. The appeal and impact of the democratic American political system has also been accompanied by the growing attraction of the American entrepreneurial economic model which stresses global free trade and uninhibited competition. As the Western welfare state, including its German emphasis on co-determination between entrepreneurs and trade unions, begin to lose its economic momentum, more Europeans are voicing the opinion that the more competitive and even ruthless American economic culture has to be emulated if Europe is not to fall further behind.
American emphasis on political democracy and economic development thus combines to convey a simple ideological message that appeals to many. The quest for individual success enhances freedom while generating wealth. The resulting blend of idealism and egoism is a potent combination. Individual self-fulfillment is said to be a God-given right that at the same time can benefit others by setting an example and by generating wealth. It is a doctrine that attracts the energetic, the ambitious and the highly competitive. As the imitation of American ways gradually pervades the world, it creates a more congenial setting for the exercise of the indirect and seemingly consensual American hegemony. And as in the case of the domestic American system, that hegemony involves a complex structure of interlocking institutions and procedures designed to generate consensuous and obscure asymmetrics in power and influence. American global supremacy is thus buttressed by an elaborate system of alliances and coalitions that literally span the globe. So the cultural hegemony or cultural imperialism of the U.S. exists. And the U.S. is able to export or exert its power, the cultural power on the rest of the world, either through hard power and the examples of that, for example, in Yugoslavia, in Libya, in Iraq, in Syria, and in many places around the world, or through soft power, which is the focus of today's video. And the examples of that also are plenty, but I will just name Ukraine, the color revolution, Georgia, a color revolution, and Armenia, a color revolution. Now, how the US exports its values around the world? Of course, they are able to do it through many aspects or many tools, as it mentioned, as, as it was mentioned by uh, Bijensky. But also, there are now these so-called non-governmental organizations, the NGOs. For example, you have the National Endowment for Democracy, you have the USAID, you have many organizations funded by the Hungarian billionaire George Soros, and the main mission of these organizations is to export or spread or indoctrinate, especially the youth, to accept neoliberalism, to accept liberal democracy, to accept capitalism and free market. Now, the recent example of this is Kazakhstan. So, you may know already the unrest, the big unrest and riots happened in Kazakhstan. Now, I checked the the website of National Endowment for Democracy and I found out that NED, National Endowment for Democracy, has spent over one million dollars in 2020 alone in Kazakhstan on projects related to democracy, human rights, rule of law, journalism, peaceful assembly, etc. etc. And the, the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy's budget is from the Congress, from the US Congress. So, this is not a conspiracy theory that NED or the USAID or Soros-funded uh, organizations are just being present in other countries in order to help the people. Of course, they may help the people, but at the same time, they indoctrinate the people and make them more attracted towards the American model in the sphere of inf influence of Russia or China, right? And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I mean, at the end of the day, the US wants to preserve its hegemony preserve its hegemony is to have uh, a hegemonic status on the cultural level and the US is succeeding in that in many places of the world. Now one of the questions is where is Russia from this? In my opinion the Russian military is superior. It has a very strong and the, the budget is not is the budget here is irrelevant because the U.S. budget is way higher than the Russian defense budget. Because at the end of the day, the budget could be used also to exert your power in many regions of the world and not only against your enemy. And this is what the U.S. does because it's present, as I mentioned, in 70 countries around the world. And it has 800 military bases. So unlike Russia, it doesn't have these military bases around the world, right? It has in very few places. 
So the budget here is necessary for the US to preserve its military hegemony in many regions of the world. But when you put the Russian army and the um, American army tete a tete, both sides are able to destroy each other. So in my opinion, there is a balance of power between uh, both armies. So yeah, the, the Russian army is very strong and it, it gives Russia the opportunity to become a superpower. However, when we go to the economic power, in my opinion, the Russian economy is still vulnerable. It heavily relies on exporting military hardware, selling military hardware, and two, selling gas. Now, one of the main partners of Russia in terms of selling gas is Europe. For example, Germany buys 70% of its gas need from Russia. But Europe and, and Germany in particular are heading slowly but surely towards greener economies. And when the time comes in a few decades that the Europe and Germany become less reliant or less dependent on the Russian gas, then Russia has to find other partners. And it's not easy nowadays to find other partners. Europe, whether you like it or not, is one of the main uh, economic partners of Russia. So Russia has to diversify its economy. It has to uh, rely on technologies, on innovations, on agriculture and other sectors. And here comes also a theory that says, and I'm not sure if this is right or wrong, it's just a theory that the global warming may help Russia because the northern belt of Russia, which is people cannot live there, there are no inhabitants. So with the global warming, this area, which is full of ice, could be melted and then used for also uh, extracting the gas that is underneath of this frozen area. And also they may be used in the future for agriculture. I'm not sure. I was just reading some of these theories online, which could be true which not or not, because it doesn't seem that Russia is as much as interested in uh, global warming as other countries. So the cultural hegemony of, uh, of Russia here, this is the third pillar, right? The cultural hegemony of Russia, in my opinion, is absent. The EU and the US, they exert this soft power more efficiently and the model of liberal democracy is more attractive to the youth, especially in Eastern Europe. And now you can go to, it, it, it needs to be verified, but if you go and pick 10 people in Ukraine and 10 people in um, Armenia, especially from the younger generation, you will see that a big percentage of them prefer the American and the European models over the Russian models, because the European and the Russian models are the European and the American models are more attractive and these countries in the West, they're also better in marketing their models. So when the Kazakhstan unrest happened and the riots erupted, how did Russia engage in this conflict? Through military power. The CSTO sent peacekeeping forces. So you feel like Russia is like a big elephant and it's very slow and it's not able uh, to exert any sort of soft power in the areas of, of influence for Moscow. And we're talking about Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, we're talking about Ukraine, Armenia, these are sphere of influence of Russia. It's not in the United States. So the Russia is not able to prevent these color revolutions. And when it happens, the only way possible for it is using military power. So, in my opinion, the cultural hegemony of Russia is so weak in this regard. And w some people say, okay, but it has the Christian orthodoxy. I mean, the Christian orthodoxy is no more attractive even to the orthodox people around the world. So it is one unattractive and it's also unrealistic. I mean, Western Europe is either Catholic, or Protestant, or atheists or agnostics. The orthodoxy is not gonna work in Europe. Here is a question. Why is these NGOs like NED, like the USAID, like the Soros-funded 
organizations are allowed in the first place to operate in, a, in, in countries that are governed by leaders friendly to Russia, right? Even before the color revolution in Armenia, under the reign of Serge Sarkisyan or Petrosyan, uh, or in Ukraine, why these organizations were operating there in the first place, well knowing that they have a duty to change the mindset of the people or to gain the hearts and the minds of the people there in favor of the United States and EU, right? And where is the cultural model of Russia from all this? How can Russia claim that they want to, be, to become a superpower, they want to change the international system from a unipolar system into a bipolar or multipolar system without having a cultural model? I think Russia has to calculate this well uh, if they want to become a superpower one day. One last thing I want to mention, Russia is heavily reliant now on the Vladimir Putin. In my opinion, this man is a geopolitical mastermind and he's, he was able to pick up, to carry Russia from a very bad situation into a position that is able to challenge the US and the West in general again. And I think he was himself was instrumental, crucial, in restoring Russia's position in the world, or relatively. So this heavily reliance on Putin is also a negative aspect. Like, what, would, what will happen when Putin dies? We are all humans, one day we will die. So what would happen? This is a question mark. On the other hand, the US is based on a system. The faces change, but the core is, is the same. So Barack Obama comes, leaves, Trump comes and leaves, Biden comes and leaves. There are certain things that never change in the US. So there is a strong deep state in the US, call it whatever you want, call it the security, the CIA, the military complex, uh, the, the oligarchs, name it, doesn't matter. There is a strong system there that is very stable, very strong, and they're able to bring politicians into power in the US, unlike in Russia. In my opinion, the American model is more sustainable here on the long term, on the long run. So what do you think? Do you think Russia is able to innovate a cultural model to export an ideology, values to the world, and would it be attractive? To the, especially to the youth? Would the youth prefer in the long run the Russian model or the European and the American models? And why is Russia still not working on this aspect? Do you think Russia is not interested in becoming a superpower because the statements say otherwise and the investment in the military and the economy say otherwise? But can Russia become a superpower without this cultural pill? Cultural pill, cultural pillar. <laughs> Let me know your opinion in the comments below. I've been your host, Kerok Al Masian of Syriana Analysis. If you're new, I truly appreciate if you subscribe to my channel and hit the like button. It helps me a lot with the algorithm of YouTube. And if you want to support Syriana Analysis, my independent political commentary work like this one, you can become a patron. The link in the description below, you can just pay $2 per month. It's a really big help for me and it helps me continue and bring content like this to you. See you next time.